Hello, welcome to this edition of Momentum. I'm Robert Green, your host. Happy today to be joined by Dr. David Wallace. Dr. Wallace is an assistant clinical professor in our Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he's also manager of our rather unique high voltage lab. Dr. Wallace, welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you come from? How did you come to be at Mississippi State? Well, I was raised in Brookhaven, Mississippi, uh, graduated high school, and at the time I knew I was going to be an engineer. Mississippi State came down and had some wonderful people meet with me, and that was the beginning of the wonderful relationship. I came here, got my bachelor's degree, and uh, went out into the world to work. And over the years, I got my other degrees, and now I'm here full time. Okay. Well, where did you go to work after your bachelor's degree? What kind of jobs did you have? I had three main jobs. Uh, my first job after the bachelor's, I was a manufacturing engineer, and I did that for probably four years. After the manufacturing, I took a position as a maintenance manager and a design engineer at a corporation. Did that for four years, and then in 96, I took the position with Kuhlman Electric, where I spent 20 years as a uh, quality manager, test engineer, field service. And it was during that time I got my other degrees and then left there and came here in 2016. Okay. So what possessed you well into your career <laughs> to come back to, to graduate school? Professor Stanislaw Grabrowski. Uh, he was my mentor. I had him as his first student in 1987 when he came here, and he tried to get me to stay for my, my master's after graduation, but you know, I was young and dumb, ready to go out into the world and make a mark. But we always kept up with each other through the years, and in 2007, he called me up and said, David, they have distance program. Get your master's. So I did. I came up, and I did the distance program with the master's. I got finished with the master's, and he said, David, you're doing a PhD. I was like, I, I, I don't need a PhD where I'm at. You're doing your PhD. Yes, sir. I did my PhD. And uh, luckily at the time uh, I had finished the PhD, he was retiring. And that's what opened up the position for me to come up and uh, fill his spot. Well, we're thankful that he was able to convince you to do that. Um, so you mentioned that you did your master's and your PhD yes. via our distance program. And of course we do have a, a very robust yes. distance education program. Tell us a little bit about your experience with that. What was it like taking classes online while also working full time? It was great. I was, I was really concerned because of the fact, you know, it had been many years between the bachelor's and the master's, but the, everybody at Mississippi State really came in. I must give kudos to Rita Burrell. She was a tremendous help uh, bringing me into the program and getting me going. And it was really nice. Uh, I was able to continue my job, work, and take the courses, everything flowed smoothly. So it was a very enjoyable experience, actually. Well, how did you come to choose electrical engineering? Yeah. Coming from Brookhaven, you had a lot of opportunities. Yes. Uh, what um, was it? What? Well, I was, grew up on a farm, so I'm a farm boy, but I always tell people there's two reasons I'm an electrical engineer. I'm an engineer because of the TV show Star Trek. Scotty was my hero. He was a ship's engineer. Scotty could do the impossible. And that's always led me to the idea that this is what engineering is. You're the guys who do the impossible. You innovate, you create, and you advance everything around you. Electrical came on due to an uncle. I had an uncle who was more like my older brother. He was about six years older than me. And one day he was playing around some of my grandfather's electrical equipment. And he challenged me to hold these little lead weights. And when I did, he proceeded to shock the living crap out of me. But I had to learn after that what created that. So I go to the library and I start reading and I start studying. And then I come across the one name that changed everything, Nikola Tesla. And from that point, my life was never the same. I knew this is what I wanted. I wanted to do the electrical and, and go forward with it. So we owe your career to uh, <laughs> being shocked and, a, and an <laughs> uncle who likes to play practical jokes. That's right, that's right. <laughs> uh, I won't ask you what you think about your uncle today. <laughs> we'll, we'll give him Wonderful the relationship. Yeah. So uh, after you got your PhD, though, you, you did come to us as yes. an assistant clinical professor and manager of the, the high voltage lab. Uh, tell us a little bit first about the courses you teach. Now, at the university, I mainly teach the uh, high voltage electives in electrical engineering. So you're looking at courses like insulation coordination, high voltage fundamentals, high voltage measurement techniques, protective relay, and the things that deal with the high voltage side of the electrical engineering program. Okay. So 
Any favorite part about teaching? What, what is it that encouraged you to do that? I really <clears throat> go back to my professors. Uh, when I was here at Mississippi, Mississippi State, my professors were of the older generation, some from World War II and all, and they had such life experiences that they could bring into the classroom on top of the theory, and it made it so much more understandable, relatable. And that's what I like to try and do now is I've got my years of experience and I can come to the classroom and teach you the class but give you the practical side of the applications, how you will go forward and use this as you go out into the world. And it's really an enjoyable experience when you, you see the looks on the faces and they're, you can see the light bulb going off. They, they get this. They understand it. I love it. Would you say that your experience working in industry has really come to help your teaching ability? Tremendously. Um, I learned from the people at the industry and at the same time I was able to start moving forward and teaching the new inductees into our company, training them. So I had a very good background on being able to teach and train the new uh, incoming personnel and I can carry that forward over into the way I teach the students. Okay. Well you're also manager of the High Voltage Lab. Yes. So for those who may not be familiar with what high voltage is, what what is high voltage to you in terms the average person could understand? Well, if you think about your voltage in your house, you have 120 volts and 240 volts. For me, high voltage in the lab goes all the way up to 3 million volts. I can create lightning. I have 1 million volts of AC, 1 million volts of DC. So we're at the extreme end of the voltage, and we use this to test all of the systems that are used to generate, transmit, and distribute electricity across the country now. Okay. So what kind, of, tell us a little bit about the history of the High Voltage Lab. How, how did it come to be and okay. the what sort of work do you Lab do? The High Voltage Lab actually was created by, uh, by Professor Paul B. Jacob. He came here in 1946 after the war and he started teaching. In 1950, he built the very first uh, High Voltage Lab. It was over in Patterson. It remained there until 1977 when they built Simmerall. At this point, he brought in the lab that we currently have today. And what we always like to point out, this is the largest high voltage lab in North America. No other university can even come close to what we offer at this place. And then he brought in all the industry they donated. They built the lab to where it is. I was fortunate enough to be able to be part of that lab during his time uh, before he retired. And then Dr. Grabowski came in and took over for Paul. So I was able to work with him. So today I'm standing on the shoulders of these two giants trying to carry forward the legacy of the lab. So you not only know the history, you live the history. I've, I've been part of the history. Yeah. So what kind of research are you doing there and has been done there? We do a lot of research for the industry. So I will bring in transformers, insulators, lines, power lines, cables. We'll test this. We do research with the Advanced Composite Institute. They're creating carbon fiber samples. We will test them for the resiliency to electricity. We also do a lot of work with the DOE, uh, DOD. I've had uh, the Army come in. The Navy brings ship models that we test. Uh, the Air Force, we've done work on wing materials. So it's a, a broad uh, picture of industry that comes into the lab for research. Well, I know you love giving tours, and it's a yes. very popular tour for prospective students, particularly yes. uh, those looking at electrical engineering. Um, so tell me a little bit more about the electric, uh, about the ships from the Navy. Being a naval, retired okay. naval officer, I need to know a little more about that. Well, we had the Navy come to us, and they brought us a model of a destroyer. And what they had done was add a helipad on the backside of the ship. They were concerned with the helicopters landing, the rotating blades generating static fields which could possibly draw lightning down to that area. So they wanted to protect the helicopters. So we studied statistically where would lightning strike the ship. And then once we knew that, how we could put protection to draw the lightning away from the back to the front of the ship to protect the helicopters back there. And then at the end, we actually got to keep the model ship and I use it as part of my tours today doing demonstrations of lightning. I've seen that model. It's getting pretty beat it's, up at it's this getting point. Shot pretty good. We may have to ask for a new one. <laughs> yes. Uh, what, what sort of future do you see for the high voltage lab in terms of projects or research? The the future is limitless. Uh, we're at the precipice of where do we go forward in our electrical generation transmission. We have the old methods: gas, coal, nuclear. We have the upcoming wind and solar. Where do we go beyond this? And then you look at the state of the grid in the United States. The grid is old. 
it needs a lot of improvements. We need to make it more robust, more stable, because you can't afford to lose power. So a lot of the research that we're doing in the lab really focuses on advancing the electrical grid and the systems in the United States, and not just the United States, but around the world, in, in order to ensure a continuous supply of electricity with very few interruptions. Okay. Well, there are three missions to, to the university. Learning is one of them, mm -hmm. so you're certainly involved in teaching classes and engaged in that. Research is the other, so, so we're doing yes. that. But then there's also service. Uh, and I know that uh, you are involved in a meter school yes. um, that is a service that honestly benefits the citizens of, of the state. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that school and how it came to be and, okay. and who tends to come to it. Well, Professor Jacob, once again, started all this. In 1950, he started the very first annual metering school. And what it did was bring in people from the utilities, from the power companies, from industry to give them a sort of advanced training, a in-depth training course. And he maintained this all the way through 1990. After he retired, it sort of went into hiatus. Last year, I actually reinvigorated the school, brought it back. So this year will be the second uh, time that we brought it back into play. So we're calling it actually the 42nd um, annual school. And each year we're getting more and more because there is a big need in the industry for people looking for this type of knowledge to be able to come in and study and learn and to have the lab as part of the school is a perfect combination. Yeah, we're, and we're happy to provide that, that service yes. to, to the industry and, and the citizens. Would you recommend electrical engineering as a profession just looking Highly. out into the future? Highly. I always tell people when you look at it, the high voltage side of electrical engineering, we are the people that's providing electricity for the world. There's always going to be the need. And then I point out through my years, I have been heavily involved in the standard committees in IEEE, uh, PES, even IEC. And at my age of 56, I'm one of the young guys. We're begging for the new engineers to start coming up and taking our place so we can start training them and start moving forward. So there will always be the need for electricity. Therefore, there's always going to be the need for the good electrical engineers. So for those interested in pursuing this, this career and, and majoring in electrical engineering, do you have 20 or 30 seconds of advice you can give to, to those students? Enjoy math. Enjoy a challenge. Be prepared to come into a field to where the doors are always going to be open. The opportunities are limitless. And it's invigorating. It's an enjoyable field. Uh, there's always something new coming up, and it's a very hands-on field. So if you're the type of person that really likes to get hands-on, get dirty, and go out and do something that's going to change the world, this is the field for you. Okay. Well, thank you for that advice, and thank you for, for all you're doing in terms of teaching and research, as well as taking time out of your busy schedule to, to come visit with us today. Enjoyed it. So enjoyed it as well. Thank you all for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you next time on Momentum.